Good morning, everyone. This morning, we'll talk about traditional theories of meaning. Any theory of meaning must account for the relevant facts, which we may call the meaning facts, that some physical objects are meaningful at all, that the distinct expressions can have the same meaning, that a single expression can have more than one meaning, and that the meaning of one expression can be contained in that of another and more. We tend to talk of meanings as individual things. Meanings have been thought to be particular ideas in people's minds, but several objections show that this cannot mean actual thoughts in the minds of particular people at particular times. Meanings have also been taken to be abstract things in themselves, alternately called propositions. Example, snow is white means that snow is white. Equally, we may say it expresses the proposition that snow is white. Proposition theory. It fits the various meaning facts well, since proposition is essentially another word for meaning. But critics have questioned whether it explains the meaning facts satisfactorily or indeed at all. Like any other theory, a theory of meaning has a propriety of data or the meaning facts. First, there is meaningfulness itself. Some string of marks or noises in the air are just string of marks or noises in the air, whereas others particularly whole sentences, are meaningful. Second, we sometimes say that two distinct expressions are synonymous. Third, we sometimes say of a single expression that it is ambiguous, that is, that it has more than one meaning. Fourth, we sometimes say that one expression's meaning is contained in that of another as female and deer are contained in the meaning of though. Now let's proceed to entity theory. This theory officially takes meaning to be individual things. First type of entity theory is ideational theories by John Locke, 1960-1955. This contend that meaning are particular ideas in people's minds. What is characteristic of ideational theories, as I am using the term, is that mental states and questions are actual states of particular people at particular times. If a string is meaningful in that expresses an idea, one may then say that for two expressions to be synonymous is for them to express the same idea. For an expression to be ambiguous, is for there to be more than one idea that it could express and so on. And regarding the phenomenon of merely verbal disagreement, the ideational theorist may say it is not that one party has one thought and the other has a different conflicting thought. They both have the same thought but are confusingly putting it in different words that sound incompatible. So an ideational theory seems to give us an intuitive way of expressing our meaning more precisely. These are the objections to ideational theories. First, if an ideational theory is to be precise enough to test, it must eventually specify what sort of mental entity an idea is. For mental images will not do at all as a matter of fact for images are more detailed than meaning. For example, an image of the dog is not just generically of a dog, but of a dog of some particular shape and size, possibly of a particular breed. An image of a triangle is of some particular type of triangle, equilateral or right or whatever. A whole thought might do as the meaning of a complete sentence, but not every sentence express anyone's actual thought. Objection number two. 
As with the referential theory, there are just too many words that have no particular mental images or contents associated with them like is, and, and all. Indeed, if images are what are on offer, there are certainly words that psychologically could not have images associated with them. For example, kiliagon or non-entity, and even when a word does have an associated image as red does, we do not always call that image to mind in the everyday course of understanding the word as it goes by. Indeed, we may virtually never call it to mind. Objection number three. Meaning is a public, intersubjective social phenomenon. But ideas, images, and feelings in the mind are not intersubjective in that way. They are subjective, held in only in the minds of individual persons, and they differ from one person to person depending on one's total mental state and background. Therefore, meanings are ideas in the mind. Objection number four. There are meaningful sentences that do not express any actual idea or thought or mental state. Now let's proceed to proposition theory. Its theories take meanings to be abstract things in themselves. These abstract items are language independent and unlike ideas, they are also people independent. Ideational theorists think of sentences almost as being pushed out from inside us by the pressure of our thoughts, but propositions are abstract, changeless, and powerless, and do not push or pull. Propositions are also objects of mental states. For example, people all over the world may believe that Asian markets are collapsing, doubt that Asian markets are collapsing, hope or fear that Asian markets are collapsing. Propositions are the fundamental bearers of truth and falsity. When a sentence is true or false, it is so only because the proposition it expresses is true or false. One argument for this claim is that Sentences change the truth values from time to time and from context to context. Objection number one. Propositions are said to be abstract entities even though sentences are not being said to express them rather than to name them as in the referential theory. Considered as entities, these abstract items are somewhat weird. They are not located anywhere in space, and since they could not be created or destroyed, they are also temporarily eternal or at least everlasting. They existed long before any living being did, even though their contents have to do with highly specific states of human affairs. Objection number two. Propositions are, in a sense, unfamiliar and alien to our experience. I hear or see words, and I understand them. But this is hardly or seem hardly a case of my doing something called grasping that puts me in touch with a supra-empirical, non-spatial, indestructible, eternal object. From Gilbert Harmon, the proposition theory does not in fact explain anything. It merely repeats the data in a fancier jargon. Whatever meaning is, it plays a dynamic role in human society. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Good day, everyone. 
Over the years, people think of how words came into me. People think what makes red to be red. How much is too much? How words like painful and heartaches describe pretty. And how words like love, care, and romance describe the sweetness of the world. Who really decides what a word becomes? Many philosophers have tried to explain how meanings are formed into our utilities. An expert once said, If you want to know what a certain sentence of Urdu means, just ask a native speaker and she will tell you. No need to wait until semanticists construct a viable theory of meaning for a fragment of Urdu that includes your sentence. Certain theory tried to address such questions. This is the use theory of meaning. Use theory of meaning posits that the meaning of an expression in an appearance is determined by how competent users use the expression. Competent users are the interlocutors who share common linguistic knowledge. The use theory of meaning in its most radical form connects the meaning of every appearance of the language with its use among speakers of the language. At the first approximation, it is a certain factor or regularity. Wittgenstein sought to illustrate word usage with examples of language games. The language is meant to serve for communication between a builder A and builder B. A is building with building stones. There are blocks, pillars, slabs, and beams. B has to pass the stones and that in the order in which A needs them. For this purpose, they use a language consisting of the words block, pillar, slab, and beam. A calls them out. B brings the stone which he has learned to bring at such and such a call. Conceive this as a complete primitive language. Here, the relevant regularities are easy to describe. For example, whenever A utters block, B brings him a block. Of course, there are situations when the regularity breaks. For example, when there is too much noise to hear or no more blocks to fetch. One of the tasks a use theory faces is to explain why such situations should be viewed as exceptions rather than counterexamples. It cannot simply be that they are rare. It could be that A and B work in a noisy environment where supplies run out of all the time, in which case A's utterances would frequently, perhaps even usually, not be followed by the appropriate response from B. Still, it doesn't seem that the meaning of block would in any way be affected by this. If use is to explain meaning, it must robust regularity, one that permits exceptions and could persist even if some of the particular events that constitute it were different. If both of these challenges are met, we have identified the role block plays within Wittgenstein's tiny language game. In this game, the roles of block, pillar, 
slab and beam are very similar. But Wittgenstein argues, once we look at more complex cases, we realize that the roles words play are desperate. Example, think of the tools in a toolbox. There is a hammer, pliers, saw, screwdriver, a glue pot, nails, and screws. And the functions of words are as diverse as the functions of these objects. So understand more about the claims of use theory of meaning, we have to understand its basic assumption that the meaning of an expression is the way in which the expression is employed by the speakers of the relevant community. Oh no! What color is it? It's red! Red! Stop! Green! Go! Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, it's green! Okay, let's go! Use theory of meaning argues that meanings are not natural properties of expressions but inferred on them by people. Based on the assumption, it is weak to conclude that linguistic expressions that have no use in the community are considered meaningless. This sounds weird since in any interesting language there are meaningful sentences that have never been used. To fill out the picture, we need to say more about what uses are and how they interact with other processes. We need to address two questions. First, what exactly are various linguistic expressions used for? And second, what sorts of roles do they play in language? Next videos, we will consider two influential attempts that aim to address these issues. One, Paul Rice, and the other, David Davis. A pleasant day, everyone. I am Rosalinda Hidalgo, and I will be talking about Psychological Theories Grice's program. Herbert Paul Grice believed that linguistic expressions has many, and it genuinely and literally express some concrete ideas or intentions of the speakers who use them. He introduced the idea of speaker meaning, roughly what the speaker in uttering a given sentence on a particular occasion intend to convey to a hearer. Since speakers do not always mean what their sentences standardly mean in the language, Grice distinguished this speaker meaning from the sentence's own standard meaning. He offered an elaborate analysis of speaker meaning in terms of speaker's intentions, beliefs, and other psychological estates and refined that analysis in the light of many objections. Grice also offered an analysis of a sentence's standard meaning in terms of speaker meaning. Grice's basic idea is that sentences are types of marks and noises, individual tokens of which are produced by people on particular occasions for a purpose. When you say something, it is usually for the purpose of communicating. You deliver yourself of an opinion 
or express a desire or an intention. And do you mean to produce an effect to mean something come out of it? Rice's reductive project includes the explication of sentence meaning in psychological terms. It proceeds in two importantly different stages. In the first stage, Grice attempts to reduce sentence meaning to speaker meaning. In the second, he tries to reduce speaker meaning to a complex of psychological states centering on a type of intention. Grice's second stage analysis has a few objections and revisions. Objection number one, speaker meaning does not in fact require an actual audience, but Grice's analysis requires not only an audience, but that the speaker has very specific intentions with respect to that audience. And this is implausible, at least for the soliloquy and delirium cases. Grice addresses the audience-less cases. He urges a solution in terms of hypothetical or counterfactual audiences. In effect, a speaker should intend that were anyone present and enjoying normal perceptual and other psychological conditions, that person would form the belief that he. Objection number two. Even when there is an actual audience, the speaker may mean something, yet not intend to produce belief by means of intention recognition. Here is an example of the former type of case. Conclusion of argument, one offers an argument, perhaps produces a proof of a geometrical theorem. Grice makes essentially two revisions. First, he suggests invoking the concept of activated belief, though some of the audience already believe what the speaker has in mind. Their beliefs may not be fully conscious and psychologically active, or even conscious at all. Grice's second revision is replacing the weaker provision that the audience be intended to believe only that the speaker believes that he. Objection number three. The speaker shows his intention, but not in a linguistic sense. There is a wider sense of communication that Grice's analysis still seems to capture. Objection number four. The speaker intends the audience to form a false belief in part on the basis of recognizing the intention. Grice responds by requiring that the audience be intended to believe there to be a mode of correlation between features of the adherence and the intended belief type. The first stage of the Grecian program is the reduction of sentence meaning to speaker meaning. He believed that sentence meaning is grounded in the mental and proposed to explicate in terms of the psychological estates of individual human beings. We can think of this as no less than the reduction of linguistic meaning to psychology. Now we will discuss some objections. Objection number one. Given a suitably disordered mental state, any speaker might mean anything at all by any string of noises he or she happens to utter. If Grice's analysis of speaker meaning is correct, then, all the worse for the first stage of this project, for there will be no formal constraint 
on what speakers might mean by any sentence they utter, but only statistics about how often speakers do mean this or that. Objection number two. Most meaningful sentences of a language are never uttered at all. Therefore, no one has ever meant anything by them. Therefore, their meanings can hardly be determined by what speakers normally or typically mean by them. Objection number three. Even when a sentence is actually uttered, it may be wildly novel, yet instantly understood by its audience. But if it is a novel, then there is no pre-established fact of what speakers normally mean or would normally mean by it. Objection number four. Sentences are often used with other than their own literal meanings, even neglecting sarcasm and other forms of indirect speech. Figurative usage is very prevalent. If Grice should want to say this, that a sentence's own meaning is what speakers normally mean in uttering the sentence, he would have to say what normally means independently of the sentence's standard meaning. There are also private codes in which a given sentence is never used with its literal meaning. Grice first concentrates on the narrow notion of sentence meaning for a particular individual that is the meaning that the sentence has in that individual's personal distinctive speech or idiolect. And he restricts his initial target further, distinguishing structured utterances from unstructured ones. A structured utterance has meaningful parts, such as individual words, which contribute to the utterance overall meaning. Unstructured utterance is a single expression of non-verbal gesture or a beckoning motion. Rice brings in the notion of a resultant procedure. For the theme of those obstacles is that unuttered and novel sentences do not correspond to any actual speaker meanings, but at least arguably they do correspond to the hypothetical speaker meanings that would be generated by Grice's abstract resultant procedures. Even though a certain sentence's literal meaning is never much by any actual speaker meaning, it may still correspond to a hypothetical resultant speaker meaning. And that is my report. Good day, everyone. Good day everyone, I am Abdul Qadir Al Sofi and welcome to our discussion for today. Today we are going to talk about verification theory. The verification principle is a philosophical attempt to challenge the meaning of certain types of language such as religious and moral language. Philosophically, we must be able to agree on a consensus for the meaning of words in order to philosophize about them and use them. If we cannot agree on the meaning, then we could not debate or analyze. The verification principle demonstrates a cognitivist approach to meaning. Cognitivists claim that language is supposed to express propositions, statements about the world, and thus can be true or false. This is also true in the religious and ethical language. A cognitivist approach then will hold on that for a statement to be meaningful, there must be ways of checking the proposition that is being made. 
Now, let us take a look at and analyze the meaning of the following sentences. The verification principle has been influenced by the work of David Hume. He argues that there are two questions to ask to any statement to decide whether it is possible to prove if the proposition is true or false. The number one, does it contain matters of fact? If so, can relate them to your experience to prove that they are true. The number two is, does it give the relationship between two abstract ideas for or reasoning of a talk? Usually, we find this on mathematics or geometry. If the answers for these questions are no, then Hume said we should reject the statement as meaningless because it will not give us any reliable knowledge about the external world. In addition, the verification principle has been influenced by the work of Wittgenstein. Now, he later changed his mind. However, this early work suggests that the function of language is to picture the word. That means, in language, we make ourselves pictures of facts. That picture is our model of reality. The words we use are linked to the empirical world. If I say, there is a chair in my dining room, then I could picture the chair. The word relates to an object in the real world. Language is for the purpose of creating a picture in our mind of how things are empirical. The Vienna Circle influenced by the work of Hume and Wittgenstein were a group of philosophers that met together in Vienna in 1920s. Their purpose was to try and establish a common criteria for meaning. The Vienna Circle adopted an approach that has become known as the logical positivism. They claim that statement has meaning if there is a method available for verifying it. Like if it is possible to perform an act that could establish statement as true. What we are concerned here is not actually the truth or falsify of the statement. It is not only true statements that have meaning. What logical positivist claim is that when I say, there is a chair in my dining room, I must be able to go into the dining room and see the chair. It is not possible then the statements lacks meaning. If I were able to check and discover no chair, then the statement is still meaningful. It is just false. The Vienna Circle established a criteria for meaning by dividing statements into three categories. These are analytic, synthetic, and meaning. When we say analytic, this means that they are true by definition. They are meaningful statements, but they do not really tell us anything because they are tautologies. They contain within their own meaning and are true by definition. I do not need to go and check them to establish their truth in the empirical world because they do not require it. This is what Ansem was trying to achieve with his ontological argument. He attempted to make God exist an analytic statement. Some examples of analytic statements are mathematical statements and statement of definitions. The second category of statement is synthetic statement. They are also meaningful. These statements are one which require additional information. These statements are propositions which make claims about the empirical world. They need to be checked for the truth with empirical evidence. Therefore, 
they are meaningful because I can go and find information needed to check and to claim the truth. The final category statement of the Vienna Circle is the meaningless statement. Any statement which are not analytic or synthetic are meaningless. Statement about feelings, emotions, subjective or abstract ideas. These are all meaningless because they are not self-evident and they do not make claims about the empirical world and it is reality. Such statements cannot be checked and they convey no meaning because they do not tell us anything about the real world. Now, let us take a look at the list of statements from earlier. It would seem from the work of the Vienna Circle that the statements can be divided in this way. Meaningful statements may be analytic such as of these two sentences. 2 plus 2 equals 4 all bachelor are single. They can also be scientific such as these synthetic statements. All bachelors are single. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. All metals expand when heated. I can go and check this proposition and so they convey meaning. However, these other statements are all meaningless because they do not convey information that can be verified through religious statements such as God exists, when we die we will be with God, murder is wrong, a sunset is beautiful, and it is hot in here. Statements that are subjective or emotive. However, here we stumble upon a bit of a problem because historical problems statements such as Julius Caesar landed at Deal in 55 BC and in the future it will be possible to time travel are also meaningless because they cannot be verified. Sure, I can go find the history book but how do I know that the writer is making a verifiable claim? I cannot go back and check claim because I cannot travel back in time and see the happenings there. In addition, future statements pose similar problem because again, I am not in the position to check. The truth of the statement when we look more closely, we can see as well in that meaningful category a few meaningless statements have appeared. I am not in the position to check all metals. I can check some. I can just go also and look at the definition of metal. But actually, this statement may be meaningless because all the time, there is the potential for metal to be discovered that does not expand when heated. Here in this world or under some conditions that I have not taken into account, then the statement is meaningless because it cannot be checked. In addition to the statement about the cat, it is actually a historical statement if we are careful. We may reduce many scientific statements to meaninglessness. What about those statements made by the physicists that propositions about the world but which we have no means of checking empirically? A.J. Eyre visited the Vienna Circle and can be described as a logical positivist. On his book, Language, Truth, and Logic, in order to explore and develop logical positivism further and avoid some of the problems that are had recent from the verification principle, clearly, it is unsatisfactorily for scientific historical statements to be considered meaningless so, Air divided verification into two types, the strong verification and the weak verification. When we say strong verification, proposition can be verified in practice. This means that I could actually go and check the statements in reality. So, the chair is in my dining room is a statement that actually can be checked because we can go walk into the room and find the chair. If I don't have a dining room or a chair, 
it will not it will soon be discovered and so this meaningful statement and the second category of the verification is the weak verification this type of statement is knowing what need to be done to check it but maybe we cannot actually do it if i make historical statements now we can see what i need to do to check the truth of such claims about what happened in the past but since i cannot time travel i cannot do it i have some evidence that count towards it because i have writing of scholars who have investigated therefore it is meaningful according to weak verification now let us go back to the previous statements and try to analyze it by weak verification according to weak verification there is some evidence that comes towards them or i know what to do to check the statement for truth but i am not going to do it because it is not practical we can move past and future statements about the empirical world into the meaningful category for the same reasons and we can see that some subjective statements can be seen meaningful because there can be some evidence that counts towards them in addition we can say that there is evidence that could count towards ethical statements because we can look at the effects of certain actions like murder or see the consensus review in addition religion statements may also be meaningful according to weak verification in contrast to the problems with verification principle as originally proposed i has accidentally made language meaningful with weak verification in fact eventually i declared that his work had mostly been false having said this the work of vienna circle and logical positivist has been very very important in the search for criteria of meaning finally this theory has shown that meaning may be more than simply the ability to have empirical object that matches with the word what is written or spoken it enabled other scholars to develop to search further for a criteria of meaning and that's all about the verification theory of our discussion for today for further readings you may visit the comment section below and please do not forget to click like and subscribe to this channel for more language learning related videos this has been teacher abdul kadir al sofi and see you again to our next video lessons discuss truth condition theories by Davidson's program. Davidson, a theory of meaning, is a descriptive semantics that shows how to pair a speaker's statements with their meanings. And it does this by displaying how semantical properties or values are distributed systematically over the expressions of one's language. In short, it shows how to construct the meanings of a speaker's sentences out of the meanings of their parts and how those parts are assembled. Under the truth conditions, Donald Davidson argued that we will get where we want to be if we replace the positivity's notion of sentence verification condition with that of the sentence truth condition. On this view, to know a sentence meaning is to know the conditions under which that sentence would be true, rather than to know how to tell whether the sentence is actually true. Davidson begins with two ideas that prove to be related. One is that a theory of meaning should afford guidance on what determines the meaning of a particular sentence. The other is that of giving central importance to the wondrous phenomenon. Davidson's idea to equate meanings with truth conditions is doubtless clever. It provides, however, a suitable basis for a theory of meaning only if a number of tricky conditions turn out to be fulfilled. Among these conditions are 
Condition 1 obviously names the core idea of Davidson's truth conditional approach to semantics, namely that to know that semantic concept of truth for a language is to know what it is for a sentence. Any sentence of a specific language to be true and this amounts in one good sense we can give to the phrase to understanding the language. The Davidsonian assumption has, however, prima facie plausibility, since we can judge a sentence truth or falsity only under the condition that we know what the sentence happens to mean. Condition 2 is that every sentence of a language has to be such that it possesses or might be analyzed as possessing a particular set of truth conditions. The existence of sentences without truth conditions would thus prove the inadequacy of that approach. Speculations about the existence of such sentences are not baseless. Questions and commands. Condition 3 asks for a suitable conception of truth. Such a conception is a conception that allows the construal of truth theories which mirror our respective languages structures. Davidson claims that a suitably modified version of Alfred Darkey's semantic conception of truth is capable to fulfill these conditions. Tarski thus defines the truth predicates in terms of linguistic meaning. Linguistic meaning is however always linguistic meaning of particular language. Davidson's project tried to explain what is involved in giving a theory of meaning for a particular language. For example, in Urdu or English, the intuitive idea of a theory of meaning for a language L is the idea of a theory that tells you what all of the words and sentences in L mean. While executing his project, Davidson sharpens this intuitive idea considerably. What is involved in explaining the shape of a theory of meaning for a language ought to take? For Davidson, such an explanation must specify two things. The form that the actions of theorems of the theory should take and the evidence that should be used for testing the theory. First constraint on the form of a theory of meaning is compositionality. So why should a theory of meaning for a natural language respect the compositionality constraint? Davidson gives two related answers. The answer from finitude, a theory of meaning aims to state what every expression in a language means. In the case of a natural language, we can simply list all the expressions and say what it means. But we can generate theorems that tell us the meaning of every possible sentence in the language. Next is the interpretative answer. Unless we view the sentences of a natural language as built up of a finite stack of smaller parts, it will be impossible to interpret the language. Second constraint on the form of a theory of meaning is convention T. What are the theorems of a theory of meaning going to look like? What is it to give the meaning of a sentence? One obvious possibility is that the theorems should be one of the following forms. S means P or S means that P where S is replaced by an expression referring to a sentence and P is replaced by an expression that refers to or states the meaning of the sentence in question. For example, snow is white means that snow is white. Davidson thinks the proposal is instructive because it suggests that nothing is in better position to give the meaning of a sentence than that very sentence itself. We should fill in the gap with something more perspicuous. What other feeling could do the job? According to Davidson, an appealing answer is, snow is white is true if snow is white. This sentence is certainly true, but we can reasonably view it as giving the meaning of that sentence, snow is white. According to Davidson, we can for doing so fits comfortably with an intuitive idea about meaning. Let's proceed to the truth conditional view of sentence meaning. To understand an indicative sentence is to know the condition under which it is true. Suppose I say, my house is on fire. In order to understand what I have just said, you must know that it is true if the following condition holds, my house is on fire. The object language, the language for which the theory of meaning is being given, and the meta language, the language in which the theory is being given, then when the object language and meta language are the same, the theorems of the theory are to have the following form. 
S is true if P where S is replaced by an expression referring to a sentence in the object language and P is replaced by that very sentence. Sentences of this general form are called P sentences. The problem with the proposal as it stands is that it only works for the special case in which the object language and meta language are the same. We need a more general constraint. Davidson rejects framing a condition in these terms. For doing so, relies on the notion of translation which is too close to the notion of sentence meaning that he seeks to elucidate. So he opts for a different tack. He suggests a constraint that is cleansed of any mention of translation. Convention T, or the Davidson's version, the theorems of a theory of meaning for an object language L must take the form S is true if P, where S is replaced by an expression in the meta language referring to a sentence in the object language, and P is replaced by a sentence in the meta language that is true if the object language sentence is true. Abandoning the appeal to translation opens Davidson to the objection that his version of convention T, T is too weak. All that his version requires is that the meta language sentence on the right hand side of the biconditional be true if the object language sentence referred to on the left hand side is true. But consider the following two possible theorems proposed as parts of theories of meaning for English and French respectively. Snow is white is true in English if grass is green. In French, la niegue este blanche is true if grass is green. Both of these sentences satisfy Davidson's convention P, but surely it would be a mistake to claim that they give the meaning of the relevant object language sentences in any sense no matter how permissive that phrase. The bottom lines are Davidson offers several arguments in defense of the truth condition theory. The main argument is that compositionality is needed to account for understanding of long novel sentences' truth condition. Thus, Tarki's style is also modeled in defining truth. English sentences surface grammar diverges from their logical forms. A theory of grammar and syntactic transformation is needed. In addition, Davidson's theory faces many objections. Perhaps the most damaging is that many perfectly meaningful sentences do not have truth values. Lastly, it may be possible to fuse Davidson with Grice by providing Gracian theory of term extensions. And that's the concept of truth condition theory. And that's the essential points under truth condition theories by Davidson's program. I hope you got it. I am your presenter, Claudine Bacar. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I am Grace V. Laraya, and today I'll be talking about truth condition theories, possible worlds, and intentional semantics. As we saw in the previous chapter, the truth condition theory understands meaning as representation, as mirroring or correspondence between sentences and actual or possible states of affairs. But we can take the notion of the hypothetical state of affairs more seriously than Davidson is willing to and consider possible states of affairs, circumstances, conditions, as Kripkean possible worlds in chapter 4. Recall that a possible world other than the actual possible, other than the actual the actual world, our own, is an alternative universe in which things go otherwise than the way they go here. And because worlds differ among themselves in respect of their component facts, of course, the truth of a given sentence depends on which world we are considering. This affords a new version of the idea of a sentence truth condition. The sentence is true in some possible circumstances and not in others. When two sentences of the same, the same truth condition, they will be true in just the same circumstances, in just the same worlds. When they differ in truth condition, that means there will be some worlds in which one is true, but the other is false. So they will not be true in just the same worlds. That set of worlds will also be the sentence's meaning. It would follow that synonymous sentences are true. 
in just the same words, whereas for any two non-synonymous sentences, there will be at least one world in which one of the sentences is true, but the other false. We saw, or it was already presented in chapter 2, that unlike Russell, Friga had rejected thesis G3 slash K3. A meaningful subject predicate sentence is meaningful only in virtue of its picking out some individual thing and ascribing some property to that thing by positing abstract entities that he called senses and arguing that singular term has one of these over and above its putative referent. Friga defended composition. According to him, the subject predicate sentence has a composite sense made up of the individual senses of its parts and is meaningful in virtue of having that composite sense, whether or not its subject even has a referent at all. As sketched so far, Figa's view sounds like a version of the proposition theory. So, so it is prey to the various objections raised against that theory in chapter 5. But Rudolf Carnap, Richard Montagu, and Jaco Hintika developed intentional logic, giving a possible world's interpretation and explication of free gun senses. Here is the idea. A singular term or predicate is said to have both an extension in the sense introduced in the previous chapter in the freegan sense or intention. The trick is to construe a term's intention as a function from possible worlds to set of things existing in those worlds that are in the predicate extensions in those worlds. Let's have an example. The intention of fat looks from world to world. In each world, picks out the class of fat things there. Fat means not just the actual fat things, but whatever would be fat in other possible circumstances. To put this idea in more human terms, if you know the meaning of fat, you know what various hypothetical things would count as fat as thing, as well as just the list of which things actually are fat. The implementation of truth condition in terms of possible worlds saves this sophisticated version of the proposition theory from Harman's objection in chapter 5, for it tells us what a proposition is in terms of we can work with independently. A proposition is a set of worlds. Here's a direct argument for possible worlds version of the truth condition theory given very briefly in Lewis 970. In order to say what a meaning is, we may first ask what a meaning does and then find something that does that. A meaning for a sentence is something that determines the condition under which the sentence is true or false. It determines the truth value of the sentence in various possible states of affairs, at various times, at various places, for various speakers, and so on. The idea is this, if you understand a certain sentence S and you are shown a possible world at random, we fly you there and dump you down in that world, miraculously making you omniscient as regards as its facts, then right away you know whether S or sentence is true or false. If you know every single fact of that world and you still cannot tell whether the sentence is true there, then you cannot understand the sentence. The sentence. So one thing that a meaning does is to spit out a truth value for any world it is given, which is to say that meaning is at least a truth condition in the sense of a particular set of worlds. Let's now move on to the advantages over Davidson's view. The possible world's view has some important advantages over Davidson's version of the truth condition theory. Specifically, it avoids objection, objections 4 and 5 that we made against Davidson. Objection 4 was the problem of coextensive but non-synonymous terms. On the possible world's view, that is no problem at all. Renate and coordinate different meaning because although they apply to just the same things in the actual world, their extensions diverge in other possible worlds. Countless worlds contain renates that are not chordates and vice versa. Objection 5 was the problem of non-truth functional sentence connectives. Here, the possible world's view displays a unique strength for it enables us to state truth conditions for certain connectives 
effectiveness directly in terms of worlds. Here's a example. Take the simple modal operator. It is possible that, as in, it is possible that the present U.S. president is fat. The latter sentence will be counted as true if and only if there is a world in which the present U.S. president is fat. And if we wanted to say necessarily there is a U.S. president, the United States exists. Intentional semantics would count that as true if and only if in every world if there is a U.S. president, the United States exists. The possible worlds theory has a deft way with belief sentences also. Let us return for a moment to Friga. As a solution to the problem of sub substitutivity, Friga supposed that a belief Friga proposed that a belief sentence can change its truth value as a result of substitution of co-referring terms because even though the two terms of the same referent they may have different senses and so a different composite sense may result from the substitutions. Carnap's saw was to require that for synonymy sentences should not only have the same intention but have that intention composed in the same way or much the same way out of the same atomic intentions. This is what he called intentional isomorphism and it rules out all the foregoing problem cases. Take for take this as an example. Either pigs have wings or they don't and if there are edible mice, then some mice are edible, are composed out of entirely different intentions, those of pig and wing in the first case and those of mouse and edible or eat in the second. Let's have the remaining objections. The possible world's theory inherits several of the objections raised against Davidson's version. One, non-declaratives and non-fact stating sentence sentences. Two, testability and six, taking truth for granted. An intentional theorist would make much the same range of replies as we did on Davidson's behalf. Objection three, Dex's, arises in a different way since the possible world's approach does not involve sentences but it does does arise since no provision has as yet been made for addixes in the intentional apparatus that's objection three the possible world's view also inherits the first two objections made against the proposition theory in chapter five wariness and alienness as i as noted in chapter 4, it is one thing to take possible worlds as a metaphor or a heuristic for explaining a way of looking at things. Kripke's view of proper nouns, it is another to appeal to them directly in serious theorizing as an intentional semantics do. The possible worlds view is also subject to objection 4 against the proposition theory neglect of meanings dynamic feature. At the time, we replied simply that even if propositions do not help in the explanation of human behavior, behavior is not the primary thing that needs explaining, rather the meaning facts are. But the objection has been pushed further against both versions of truth condition theory. Objection 7. There is still problem of substitutivity. For there seem to be contexts in which synonymous, not just coextensive terms, cannot be intersubstituted without possible change of truth value. Damits and Putnam's pointed out in Objection 8. A sentence meaning is what one knows when one knows what a sentence means. But to know what a sentence means is just to understand that sentence. And understanding is a psychological state, one that inheres in a flesh and flood, flesh and blood human organism and affects that organism's behavior. Now, if what a sentence means is just its truth condition, how can knowledge of truth condition per se affect anyone's behavior when Conditions are often wide properties of sentences in the sense that they ain't in the head and knowledge of truth conditions is a conspicuously wide property of people. The truth condition of dogs drink water here differs from that of dogs drink water on twin earth 
but the difference is irrelevant to behavior and cannot affect it. But understanding, knowing the meaning, must and does affect behavior. Therefore, understanding is not or not merely knowledge of truth condition, and so meaning is not or simply truth condition. Here is the summary of this chapter. A sentence truth condition can be taken to be the set of possible worlds in which the sentence is true. Possible worlds can be used to construct intentions for substantial expressions which will combine compositionally to determine the containing sentence's truth condition. The resulting view avoids both the problem of co-extending but non-synonymous terms and the problem of non-truth functional connectives. The possible world's theory also depend, depends Frigga's solution to the problem of substitutivity, but the theory inherits a number of Davidson's original difficulties and infers one or two more. That ends my report. Thank you so much for listening.